And at one point, <laughs> he says, Mr. Warhol, I just have to tell you, I don't understand your art. And Andy turns to Jonathan and says, yes, you do. Hello, I'm Alex Flood, and you're watching Enemy with Oscar-nominated filmmaker and the maker of a new documentary about the Velvet Underground, Todd Haynes. Hey, Alex. Every Velvet Underground fan knows that there is no greater joy than watching Lou Reed take down a journalist. <laughs> I'm hoping you're going to be a bit kinder to me today. Should I take off my shoe right now and <laughs> see what happens? Um, I mean, just telling the truth would be a good start. In, in <laughs> I'll be gentle. <laughs> Um, I think my favourite Lou moment from an interview is this, um, I think it's a 1972 interview and he's speaking to an Australian journalist who asks him, uh, you write a lot of songs about drugs, is that because you like taking them? And he goes, no. And then later in the interview, the same journalist asks, what do you spend your money on? And he goes, of course, <laughs> on drugs. <laughs> I'm telling you that. Stay on your toes with that guy. Exactly, yeah. But I'm saying that mainly to illustrate the point that Making a film involving Lou Reed as one of the main subjects is quite difficult when all the archive material is interviews where fact and fiction are kind of blurred together. <laughs> right. I mean, look, the fact, the, 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 the premise of fact and fiction being blurred together is something that I've very much embraced in the films I've made about musical subjects, like my Bob Dylan movie, I'm Not There, and my glam rock movie, Velvet Goldmine. And what's funny is people ask me a lot like, well, how different is it to do a documentary? This is your first documentary. And still, you know, every documentarian is, is it's a subjective uh, process. And their own points of view are informing every, every decision. There is no objective truth. It's always a combination or an interpretation at least, at the very least, of fact and an interpretation of fiction and the ways in which fiction folds into the lives of, of musical artists, particularly because they draw, they turn their real life experiences into fiction, into music or books or films. So I, I don't, I don't separate, it's hard to maintain some rigorous separation between the two. But did you kind of go into a YouTube hole of watching lots of interviews with Lou and John? Well, I did, you know, and, and the big challenge, of course, in a film, in this project, is that we had John Cale with us, and we don't have Lou Reed. And Lou Reed is the foundation of this band and the auteur behind all of the songs, right? And one of the great figures of, of rock and roll. Um, and this would have been a different film if Lou was around. I would have interviewed. I would have interviewed him. I would have given anything to interview Lou Reed and risk whatever that would have uh, engendered. But I, I would feel like he would be talking to somebody who isn't a journalist, who's a filmmaker, and maybe somebody who he's seen some films of, or I don't know. That there would have been some reason. I, 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 as, I assumed that when Laurie Anderson approved me as somebody to go to to make this. It might have been because Lou knew my work or had seen something I'd done. He was a very engaged audience, you know, film goer and museum goer and active, engaged person in New York. You didn't get to meet I never, But I never met him in the years I was there. I'd see him at openings of the Whitney Biennial or something, you know. Across the room. Across the room with Laurie, and we'd all be like, oh my God, it's Lou Reed. Um, but no, I couldn't, I, I was too scared. I mean, I had friends who would have, who went up and said, Mr. Reed, I love your music so much, you know. Pow! Um, what would you have said? Oh, I would have wanted to really, I would have wanted to sit down and talk to him. Now, you know what this is like. You interview people, right? I, I'm a filmmaker. I, I, I do research, and I have interviewed people for dramatic films I've made. But for a documentary, you really have to learn the art of the interview. And I think as people who interview artists or filmmakers or whatever know, is it's an improvisation. You might have your questions and your research, but they're going to take it somewhere slightly different. And you kind of got to roll with it. And then, then you'll get 
something more genuine and more important from that, meaningful from that. I'm not sure there's an interview manual for interviewing Lou Reed. Though. It's kind of <laughs> that is that is that is I'm sure true. <laughs> a what not to do manual. Yeah. So you mentioned Laurie there. Um, were you given the idea to make a documentary about the Velvet Underground, or was it kind of you always wanted to do this? No, it, it, uh, neither. It, it, it came to me as a, as a question. I think Laurie had moved Lou Reed's archive to the New York City Public Library, making it available to people, to the public. And around this time, I think she was in conversations with people at UMG and Verve, where the masters reside. David Blackman does film and TV stuff for uh, UMG Polygram. And so David came to... And I think they were saying, would this be a time to maybe have a documentary made that would go into more detail than we've done in the past? And if so, who are some people you'd feel cool uh, suppressing? And shortly after that, um, David went to my producer, Christine, and said, would Todd be interested in doing a doc about the Velvets? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> Where do I sign? <laughs> Seriously. I mean, I, I knew it would be a challenge. And I knew it was something I'd never done before. <clears throat> but... Um, but it was, but I, and, but I knew also <clears throat> that it's because the only material of the Velvet Underground that exists on film is the films of Andy Warhol. And what band can you say that about, right? What band one. can you say, one. <laughs> and what band is such, exists so much in the crosshairs of this insane moment in, in artistic, life that, that is New York in the mid-60s, where visual artists were starting to make films and filmmakers were starting to think about music and poets were going to happenings and performing on Andy Warhol's stages or whatever. This was a time of tremendous artistic, you know, cross-pollination. You mentioned all these kind of artists and sort of iconic figures that are actually in the film, and you've got some great little quotes. And one of my favourite ones from the time is Cher saying, um, uh, "This will replace nothing except suicide." About the Velvet Underground, yeah. 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 <laughs> is is that something you go to the artist for comment now? Because I want, I bet she would change her mind now. Yeah, I think she would. I'm. A, I feel a little. I lo I love Cher. I I think sh the world of Cher. She's so in insanely talented and such an amazing actress in film. Um, but no, I felt like it was okay. I'm gonna make a film that doesn't interview everybody who came after the Velvets, um, which include countless incredible musicians and artists and critics, right? Who could just say why they love the Velvets, what the Velvets mean, and but I just was like, you know what? I don't want to make a movie that tells you how important they are. I want a movie that shows you that and let the viewer maybe enter this world as best we can, give it to them, and try to make those connections and those revelations themselves, you know? Another of my favorite sort of bits in the film is um, when um, Mo Tucker, the drummer, obviously, the Velvet Underground, is talking about um, when they'd be practicing and uh, she was just kind of thinking or wondering when Lou and John would sort of go off and start playing all this sort of absolute sort of atonal nonsense. And right. she'd be sat there and she'd be just be thinking, right, just keep banging away at the drums. <laughs> They'll come back eventually. <laughs> and they always did. And that's when the magic happened. And yeah. what I wanted to ask you is how much of an underrated and important figure is Mo Tucker in this band? Think about it. This is a band that includes two of the most influential women in rock and roll in the mid, that came out in the mid 60s, not a particularly feminist period for music. Um, Mo Tucker and Nico. And, and Mo's unique sound, uh, influenced by African drummers and Charlie Watts and Bo Diddley, a kind of tribal sort of, you know, rawness. Um, steadiness and lack of flamboyance is really what held this band, bound this music together, which was which then could do exactly what she describes. It could it could explore and experiment 
in all the layers above those drums. Oh, it's interesting that you mentioned Charlie Watts because obviously he's sadly passed recently. Yeah. Um, have you kind of spoken about him to any of the interviews from the film that maybe didn't get into the final cut? Because I imagine Mo Tucker would have mentioned him, maybe. No, she didn't. She does. She talks about hearing um, the Stones and not fade away and having to pull her car off the road. Of course, I remember, yeah. And that being a singular moment for her. You know, the things about what was happening in the 60s uh, in, in, uh, with bands as influential and well-known and successful as the Stones and the Beatles and Bob Dylan, and then as with bands that were really more on the periphery or Bo Diddley and R&B, who people knew well, but not as well as they knew those superstar mainstream rock and roll bands. Um, they were hearing things that we don't hear anymore because this music has been so incorporated and you know, absorbed into our culture. So one of the things that I wanted to try to do in the movie was like, see if I could put it in a context where you're hearing it more freshly. And again, that's not about people telling you how to hear. It's really letting you hear, letting you hear the drones of Lamont Young, and then hear that first Velvet's cut that finally lands a good way into the film with the full vocal and a full completed production. So that you're like, oh right, that's what was new about it, you know? That's not always easy to do with music that by now the Velvets really have become as well known as so many of this, as these other bands. Obviously, you're a big fan of the Velvets. You've spoken before about how they kind of gave you this kind of iconic figure to focus on when you were in college, and the kind of the music helped you through some stuff. Was there anything that you didn't know that you found out while making the film? Oh yeah, there was a lot. I mean, I, I learned more about <clears throat> um, all of it, and then there were things like when I when I decided to just interview people who were there. I wanted to get Jonathan Richman. I knew he was there. I didn't know he was there to the degree that he was there. That he literally was there for 60 to 70 shows. That when Jonathan Richman heard his very first Velvets show in 1967, Nico was no longer singing with the band. And he went to the bookstore across the street and he asked if he could like sneak, if they could make him a fake student journalism, journalist pass so he could get into the show. And he got, get, so he, they did. She was, the bookstore owner was one of the people he sincerely and devoutly thanked at the end of his interview with me. And he went in and he literally got backstage. Well, that night, Nico came to Cambridge for some reason. She wasn't gonna perform. Andy Warhol came. He wasn't touring with them anymore. John Cale was still in the band. And so Jonathan Richman, fucking Jonathan Richman, this like teenager, you know, like aspiring artist, didn't know what he was going to be. Probably kind of irritating to be around. <laughs> so, you know, he's hanging out and talking to Andy Warhol. And at one point, he says, Mr. Warhol, I just have to tell you, I don't understand your art. And Andy turns to Jonathan and says, yes, you do. And I'm like, awesome. Like, so gentle, so kind, and so right on. Because we all understand Andy Warhol's art, even when we think we don't. You know, so that kind of, like, openness to a kid like that, I had no idea. So Jonathan served as a fan, a musician, a sort of musicologist because he's playing along with the band and telling you how to hear that music. So he served all these additional purposes while still being somebody who was there. And you must have got sort of what once the word was out that you're making this film, musicians who are big fans of the Velvet sort of emailing or calling you and being like, I need to talk about them. Did that happen? <laughs> not, not too much, I have to say. Because musicians are also not aggressive. You know, like most of them that I... Apart from Lou Reed, <laughs> You sometimes. might know well, with one major exception. <laughs> but uh, they don't necessarily want to put their... You know, they want to be called rather than call you. 
you know, I get that. But people who are deep um, experts on the band and who really are sort of scholars on the Velvet Underground and people who have really written about the Velvet Underground and have archives uh, of, for the band, those folks did reach out to us. We reached out to them, but they were in a couple of places. They, they extended their their um, interests. And one of them was Jonathan Richman. <laughs> yeah, well, just the fact that he agreed to be in the movie was rare because a lot of people have tried to get Jonathan on film and he's very reticent to talk about his own music. He's very reticent to talk about the Velvet Underground. By the end of his interview, I was, I was, in, I was weeping because it was so heartfelt and so total and generous. And uh, he's, he's something else. You mentioned Andy Warhol, and the film is quite heavy on his importance with the band. Um, obviously, Lou Reed went on to be this massive figure, and all the musicians in the band did more work. But do you think that without Andy Warhol sort of taking them under his wing, the financial support, obviously he gave them a studio for a year to, <laughs> to make yeah. that album, do you think the Velvet Underground as we know them would have existed if he hadn't done that? I think Lou answers that question in, in audio clips that we have in the film. And basically the answer, I think, according to those guys, would be probably not. Um, or they would have existed even more marginally than they, you know. Look, that, that platform that Andy Warhol gave them distinguished them as a sort of cultural event in the time and a kind of can't-miss spectacle, for, particularly for New York City. But as Danny Fields says in the film, and in, in ways, you know, someone who loves that music and appreciated what they were doing sonically and musically so deeply, he was like, it was a, de it was a distraction from what they were about. That doesn't mean they didn't need it, too. And there's a lot of bullshit that musicians have to go through to promote themselves. Um, of all kinds with studios and labels and promos and photographs, you know, all this stuff. Well, if the one thing you have to do to promote yourself is hang out with Andy Warhol at the factory and look really cool and go to a lot of great parties and be the centerpiece for the exploding plastic inevitable shows at the Dom, I'd take it. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. Well, it was an offer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's almost a shock in the film seeing Andy Warhol as Andy Warhol because he's there's so many cameos of actors playing him in films and TV shows that you almost expect sort of someone to come on. And it reminded me, actually, of, have you seen the film Basquiat? Yeah. Of, you know, David Bowie plays Andy Warhol in that. What, what did you think of that? I haven't seen it since it came out, so it's really a long time ago. I think it's really hard to play Andy Warhol. And to be honest, I, you know, I'm the biggest David Bowie fan walking the planet, or I'm sure there's people would challenge me for that <laughs> mantle. But... I don't, I think he's really hard to play. I don't think Bowie got it. I, you know, the person who's closest to Andy Warhol, who I know, Gus Van Sant. Oh, really? Gus has this funny kind of vacancy in the way he talks. And Gus knows this. Does and he do an impression at parties? Or? No, he doesn't even have to. It's like something you, it's, he's not, he's too vacant to do he that. He just wears the wig. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my, a boyfriend I had, Jim, Jim Lyons, who was a dear friend and editor who passed away. He, one of, he had a project in mind, to, a portrait film about Andy Warhol, and Gus agreed to star, and then, but Jim didn't, didn't last. But, um, but uh, he's hard, and a lot of times not, I don't think Bowie did this, but like in the Doors movie really bugs me how lasciviously he's played and how luridly he's played. Um, pred he's like played as a predator. <laughs> Um, and you think he did the... He did, he did no, the, I think it was just conceived incorrectly in the script as some queer, kind of like tongue-licking, you know, like kind of like gross, yeah. lurid guy. That's not yeah. who Andy Warhol was. He was very shy and very weird and very passive. But there wasn't a person I interviewed for this film um, who was there and knew Andy and was at the factory who didn't say the most loving things about him and describe this place of safety to create within that he provided. Um, and so I think they were lucky to be there. Yeah. Obviously, I've got to ask at the end of the interview, um, 
What do you think Lou Reed would have made of your film? Because Received Wisdom tells us that Lou wouldn't have liked it because he didn't like much of anything by the sounds of it. <laughs> I don't know. I can't really say. I mean, I, <clears throat> I know that um, <clears throat> I think it depends. These are very personal stories. There's no way that a documentarian coming from the outside generations later is necessarily going to know what everyone's experience is like. You can't possibly. I'm never going to please everybody who, who loves this band. Um, Amy Taubin, who's in the film, who was there in the factory, who's a film critic, she says it, was, it reminds her of that time and place. She, you know, she was very closely connected to the avant-garde cinema that was coming out. This movie really features that. Lou's family, I just saw it at the New York Film Festival, and they were, um, and Meryl, his sister, had trepidation and concerns about the film and being in the film. And she was extremely moved by it and was sobbing, and she said, you are now a member of the Reed family. It was very touching to hear. Sylvia, Sylvia Reed, who was married to Lee Reed for 20 years, um, loved the film and came twice to the New York Film Festival to see it, which was very cool. She wasn't involved with us because she came afterwards. But yeah. uh, So that's all, that all means so much to me. But everybody should have their own feelings about the Velvet Underground. And this film doesn't have to please everybody. It, you know, that's okay. Yeah. Um, also, I have to ask you, uh, as a Velvet Underground fan, favorite album? I think I know what you're going to say from watching the film, but... <laughs> what could it be? <laughs> um, it's hardly an original choice. Uh, the first record is, is just, uh, you know, it's, a, it's the record they spend the most time rehearsing, touring with, um, sort of forming their their unity as a group, their cohesion as a group around, and then had to figure out a way to incorporate, to fold Nico into that. And so they also had to work with sort of a new element that they made work, you know? Sometimes a thing that you think is not, that is the biggest like left field, you know, um, element is the thing you have to put the most thought into. And whatever happened with Nico in that first record, it set in motion uh, a solo career unlike anybody, you know, like a completely unique artistic career with its such integrity and such richness and depth. Um, so yeah, that first record's pretty, the crazy thing about the Velvets is they put up four records and they're all completely different from each other. Oh, you've left out number five. Squeeze. Well, <laughs> <laughs> technically, technically a Velvet Underground Yeah, record, I guess so. But not really. Not I'm really. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Without with, any Not with Lou. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, lots of people have a soft spot for Loaded. Yeah. Which I'm one of those, even yeah. though obviously it's after John Cale. Loaded right? is incredible. It's an amazing record. It doesn't have the, it doesn't have Mo, Mo Tucker playing drums. I think there's a, bo a binding that she brings to the other records that it lacks. But it's, it's a look it's, it's full of so many great songs, and it's a look into what this extraordinary solo career was going to become, what was possible. Um, there are songs in Loaded that are just some of the most beautiful in, I think Ocean is just a masterpiece, you know. Sweet Jane is a, is a standard, you know. Things that he'd been trying to achieve, he achieved in Loaded for the first time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking about the Velvets for so long, Todd. Thanks yeah, for speaking great. to us. Yeah, it was great. I had a great time, Alex. Thank you.